Hi, I'm Lee Veris. I've been a commercial photographer for over 40 years working in the entertainment advertising industry. I've shot for album covers and movie posters, and I've been digital in one form or another for over 20 years. Today I'm going to be talking about how the mirrorless camera systems are changing the way photographers approach the photo workflow, and I'm suggesting that we can reevaluate the traditional RAW file workflow. What I'm talking about here can apply to many mirrorless cameras, but I'm most excited about the Fuji X system cameras and specifically Fuji's latest camera, the X-Pro2, which I feel is the ultimate expression of the mirrorless approach to photography today. Fuji likes to call this evolution to revolution, and they show this transition from a big heavy system to a small light all-in-one camera. But really, I don't think the attraction of mirrorless is all about size and weight. The evolution of photo technology has been involved in three areas. Pre-visualizing the image, starting with a ground glass or some kind of viewfinder, and eventually settling on the DSLR approach, reflecting off a mirror, giving you an optical image through the same lens that takes the picture. Capturing the image on some sort of receptive media and realizing the image which has traditionally been a post-processing sort of thing, developing film and making prints, uh, finally becoming the image processing stage of the digital capture. Now, digital technology has impacted all of these areas, but basically has just substituted ones and zeros for silver salts and chemistry. And the three areas of pre-visualizing, capturing, and realizing have still been treated as separate stages of the whole photographic process. Fairly early on, digital capture became all about the RAW file, preserving that captured data and processing it after capture to craft the best possible image. While you could get an instant preview of the image on that little LCD screen on the back of the camera, we were all advised to not trust the LCD. I even told students they should tape over that little screen. The term chimping was coined as a derogatory for the process of continually checking the screen after the shot. We were all told to check the histogram to determine the correct exposure, shoot to the right to get the best data. It became all about the quality of the data, not the actual image. The image could be made better later if you had the right data. Now, for my part, though, I have to tell you, I've never sold a histogram, not even a really good one, to a client. Now the mirrorless cameras have changed the equation in a way that integrates the three areas of pre-visualization, capture, and realization by introducing the electronic viewfinder. This provides us with the opportunity for a what you see is what you get experience of capturing images. You don't need to check the back to verify that you got the shot because you can now see it when you take it. This to me is the essence of the mirrorless revolution and we will be exploring this in detail in this presentation. We're also going to explore the notion that JPEGs are bad. In fact, we will see that JPEGs are not bad at all. Now, I know this is a very difficult thing for most of you out there, so we're going to do a little photo group therapy session now. So, so repeat after me, JPEG is my friend. Okay, to see how this is possible, we're going to look at Fuji's film simulations and shooting modes as creative ways to craft the image in camera. Uh, but before I dive into all of this, as a preview, I will talk about my own journey to mirrorless convert. My first mirrorless camera was a Fuji X-Pro1. I was looking for a lightweight travel camera with interchangeable lenses for a trip I was going to take to Italy. I just didn't want to lug my Canon DSLR around. I was attracted to the Fuji because it had f-stops on the lens, shutter speeds on a dial on top, and this handy little exposure compensation dial. The retro design of the camera just felt really comfortable for an old film camera user like myself. I knew how to work this camera the moment I picked it up. Oh, and this camera introduced the hybrid viewfinder, which could give you an optical rangefinder style image as well as an electronic viewfinder. However, when I started shooting with it, I was still using my preferred RAW file workflow. I shot RAW plus JPEG on my trip and pretty much ignored the JPEGs once the file format was supported by Adobe. 
for a few years afterwards, I shot RAW only, bringing everything into Lightroom and processing the images there. And I was happy as a clam. I loved working with this camera, though I ended up giving up on the optical image in favor of the EVF. I recently upgraded to the new Fuji X Pro 2, and this is when things started to change for me. I saw the light, as it were, after I did my first initial tests. Now, what I do when I get a new camera is to take it out into my backyard and just take start taking the most banal, ordinary shots. I'd heard about the new film simulation mode, so I shot RAW plus JPEG and experimented with some of the new modes, but, but really just snapping away at things just to see what the camera did. I, I tried Velvia and uh, the Acros black and white, which everyone was raving about. I don't know what I was expecting to see about black and white with this particular shot, but I was also testing the new 90mm f2 lens, and a good way to check the quality of sharpness as a lens is to shoot backlit tree branches and zoom in on the file and see how sharp the branches are against a bright sky. Yeah, this lens is sharp. Anyway, I was shooting all kinds of really dull photos until I got to this, a shot of my wife's little red Mazda. Now this is a JPEG straight out of the camera using the Velvia film simulation. Well, looked pretty good. So I thought I'd check out the RAW file. Okay, so the Velvia JPEG looked really good, but I was pretty sure I could make the RAW file look as good, if not better. So I tried. Fiddling a bit with the basic sliders, I could get the hue and saturation to match pretty good but I struggle to maintain the subtle tones and colors and the gradations. Look at this little highlight. The Adobe process version started to merge into the overall color the closer I got to the Velvia version for saturation and color. And the subtle highlights here, I couldn't maintain that slight blue from the sky reflections. Now I'm an expert in image processing and I can go into Photoshop and work some juju with LAB and luminosity masks to get this to match. But the point here is that if I hadn't seen that Velvia version, I wouldn't know to aim for that look. Fuji is clearly doing something way more sophisticated in their color and tone mapping to get this look. Hmm. Yeah, beginning to suspect that this might be true. How many of you out there have actually shot Velvia film? This is what Fuji says about Velvia a high contrast palette of saturated colors suited to nature photos. Well, it's certainly good with red. So I proceeded to shoot lots of red things. This one is shot in the Chihuly Garden and Glass Museum in Seattle. All straight out of camera Velvia JPEGs. This one shows off the saturated green that is also typical of the Velvia rendering as well as the red. Okay, so Velvia is cool. Let's let's try out some of the other film simulations. So I tested Astia, Astia Soft for portraits. So here is Astia Soft film si simulation straight out of the camera on the right. Open shade with auto white balance. Very attractive. This was shot during one of our portrait workshops in Seattle. I think I did a pretty good job of matching the hue and saturation in the skin tones using Lightroom, but there's a little more tonal shape in the blue shirt and more detail in the hair in the Astia version. And the skin tone just has this kind of really nice, subtle glow to it. Uh, Astia turns out to be really good with very high contrast lighting situations. Here is a Chihuly glass sculpture uh, shot with the sun directly behind shining through in Velvia. And here's the same thing with Astia, much softer with better highlight detail and softer sh shadows. Astia is particularly good with blue hour photos. This is a shot from my recent visit to Oman at the Royal Opera House in Muscat. It's just gorgeous. The, the, the enhancement of the blues really works and the uh, Astia is just great with this high contrast lighting situation. Uh, another contrasty lighting situation, this is a multi-shot panorama of a traditional Omani house, and Astia renders the contrasty scene very well with good color saturation and detail in the highlights and shadows. 
Here's another really contrasty situation, and the soft rendering works very well for my wife, the Mistress of Light, Bobby Lane. Uh, this was shot right outside the EMP Museum in Seattle at the Seattle Center. Uh, just so you can see what was going on here, the sun was reflecting off this Frank Geary building and casting hard direct reflections. Uh, and even with the hard direct kick of light on her, the Astia film simulation is very soft and forgiving. Now here's an example where I think it's a little too soft. This was taken during Bobby's Portraits Unplugged workshop in Dubai. Now, you can still edit the JPEGs. So I just took the black slider down a little bit to snap in some contrast and just one simple move in the slider and it just really sings. I really prefer the color of her hair and the rendering of the blue. Up until this point in my testing, I'd been using a lot of different settings without really knowing what I was doing. And uh, we're going to look at the uh, next here. I, I discovered that you actually have quite a lot of control over the rendered images by taking advantage of Fuji's shooting modes. So we have image size and quality, film simulation, grain effect, dynamic range, white balance, highlight tone and shadow tone, color, sharpness, and noise reduction. And, you know, some of these things are fairly obvious. We've, we've seen a little bit about the film simulations, but dynamic range and highlight tone uh, and shadow tone, they, they deserve a little bit more explanation. So dynamic range is a setting for overall contrast. 100% uh, is considered normal and 200 and 400 percent are softer. Now, auto will change from 100 percent to 200 percent when you select an ISO above 400. Uh, and if you manually select 200 or 400, you won't be able to use the softer rendering below the cutoff ISOs of 400 and 800 anyway. So what I do is I keep the dynamic range at 400 percent to ensure lower contrast for low light situations, which tend to be more contrasty. And it always kicks back to 100% when I go down to ISO 200, which is the native ISO of the Fuji X cameras. Now, highlight tone is a contrast setting just for highlights. And it go, goes from a minus 2 to plus 4, with 0 being normal. Minus settings move the highlights darker, as expected, and that reduces the contrast. Now, shadow tone, however, it uses the same values and perhaps counterintuitively in the same way, minus settings are softer, moving the shadow values higher. So minus uh, two would be like a, a lighter shadow rather than a darker shadow, which is something to keep in mind. So let's demonstrate this. Here's Bobby again, shot with the Acros film simulation. We'll take a look at this uh, in detail in a moment. And a shadow tone setting of plus three. So we're making the shadows darker here. And here is the same shot with a setting of zero. So you can see the, the shadows have opened up nicely here. OK, so you've probably noticed that I have sh several shots here that are processed in different ways. And this is because the Fuji cameras are capable of processing raw files in camera after the capture. At any time after shooting, if you shoot RAW plus JPEG, you can come back and reprocess any number of variations in camera. When you're playing back an image, if you press the Q button, um, it's when you're playing back and you just press the Q button, when you've got a menu of all the shoot mode settings that you can change to set up a new rem rendering, you hit the Q button again and you can save the new JPEG right to the card. So let's take a look in detail at the new black and white film simulation of Acros, available with yellow, red, and green filter simulations. So here's the Adobe Standard RAW from a shot I captured at the Fish Market in Dubai, which is a really great location for street photography. And here's the Acros with the green filter setting. Now, if we look up close, here we are at one-to-one, -one, we can see that uh, Acros has some interesting sharpening. And attempting to get the raw file to look as sharp is not all that successful. Look at the detail in the hair in the Acros version. Plus, Adobe's sharpening accentuates the noise in the, in the skin, which is pretty much absent in the Acros version. 
here I'm converting it to black and white just just for comparison but you can still see the detail in the hair and the eyebrows in the Acros version is really impressive and this was shot at ISO 1600 so um, you know the noise is really quite lovely with the Acros so one of the big things about using these film simulations is that you see the results of this film simulation in the EVF now here's the raw file in color. If, if I'd seen this in color in the viewfinder, I might have decided that that man in the red shirt in the background was too distracting. And I might have moved to try and eliminate those men in the background. And I might have missed this great unposed moment. But this is what I saw in the viewfinder. Shooting in black and white affects the way you see the scene and it becomes much more part of the moment of capture. The notion of pre-visualization goes away and actually becomes simply seeing the shot. So Acros renders a really nice subtle range of tones, just all on its own. This again, straight out of the camera, JPEG. And when combined uh, with a minus two highlight tone, you get very subtle differentiation and highlight values. This and the following images were captured at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Beautiful highlights. And here's a, a plus two shadow tone, and this created deep shadow tones for sort of a dramatic rendering. And this scene was all white marble and had a much lower contrast appearance to the eye. Uh, with Acros and a plus three shadow tone, the shadows got a lot deeper with extra impact. Okay, so let's get back to the film simulations. Fuji has a bunch of them. We have Provia, which is standard, considered standard here. Velvia, Vivid, Astia, which is soft. So these are like the two, three big film simulations, the color film simulations. And then we have Classic Chrome, Proneg High, Proneg Standard, Acros, in the yellow, red, and green filter simulations. And then Monochrome, which also comes with yellow, green, and red film simulations, and uh, sort of the requisite sepia film simulations. So let's uh, let's take a look at these. Okay, so here's Provia Standard. This is sort of like the default you, you get when you first open up the camera. Uh, here's the Velvia. Get a look. You sort of pop the saturation there. Here's the Astia Soft. It still has kind of a saturated look, but it's much softer contrast. Here's the classic chrome, which I guess is meant to emulate sort of an, uh, you know, a, a standard uh, transparency film. Here's the Pro Neg High, and, and this is the one that I was using primarily uh, when I was shooting with the uh, X-Pro1, just as a kind of pre-visualization uh, tool. And here's the Pro Neg Standard. You know, so I would move between the Proneg High and Proneg Standard, basically just just as to see the image in the EVF. But I found that I had a tendency to underexpose a bit uh, when I wrote relied on the viewfinder when I was using, uh, especially when I was using the Proneg Standard, because um, the shadow values are so open. So I started playing around with Velvia, the most contrasty viewing mode, to compensate for this tendency. And now that I'm shooting with the X-Pro2, I'm actually changing the film simulations to suit the scene, and I've really adapted to judging exposure perfectly based on what I see in the viewfinder. I never look at the histogram anymore. Uh, let's keep going here. This is Acros, um, sort of without the filter simulation. Here's Acros with the yellow filter simulation, Acros red, and Acros green. You can see they, they're dramatically different from each other. Uh, they're meant to simulate using red, green, or blue filters over the, over the camera when shooting black and white. And here's my least favorite. This is the sepia simulation. I just find this kind of dull and unattractive. And I'd rather take the Acros black and white and add the tone later in, in Lightroom. Now, Fuji has a monochrome film simulation that's very similar to Acros, but it is missing the sharpening effect that gives that enhanced detail. And here we're looking at uh, detail in the, in the hair of the blonde girl. You can kind of see the Acros on the left here. It just seems a little sharper and has just a little more differentiation of the individual strands in the hair. Um, 
and Acros also has a nice subtle sort of film grain look that I that I find pretty attractive. These last two shots here are shown at 200%, shot at ISO 200. I don't see any reason to use monochrome when Acros is available. Now, despite how great the Acros film simulation is, there are times when having more control over the conversion process is desirable. And I'll show you what I mean here. So here's Bobby again in Acros with the red filter. And uh, here she is in Astia Soft. And here is a Photoshop conversion utilizing the red and green channels of the Astia color to create the black and white. The actual red channel is a bit lighter on the skin tone. And I masked in some of the green channel for Bobby's eyes and lips to put in just a little more contrast. Now compare this with, with the straight Acros red filter. So you can see it's a little darker overall with, with pale lips, not, not quite as nice. So the raw file can be used in combination with the film simulation. So I always shoot raw plus JPEG. It also gives you the ability to reprocess uh, the, the JPEG. If you have the raw file saved, uh, you can return to it and reprocess it different ways. But anyway, uh, here's the Acros Red. Uh, this was one of Bobby's shots from our Hollywood Glamour workshop in Los Angeles. I'll zoom in a little bit here to see it better. Uh, shooting in black and white mode is really great for this style of photography because you're really kind of pre-visualizing it the way uh, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd want to end up with it. However, for a creative approach, I've got the standard RAW file uh, so I can access the color easily. And you can open the RAW and the black and white into Photoshop as layers. So I put the Acros black and white on top of the color, change the layer blend mode to luminosity. And this gives the advantage of the enhanced sharpness and lighter skin rendering of the Acros with the color from the original color, uh, the RAW file. Now I do a little bit of retouching, and I have end up with a sort of hand-colored look for that classic Hollywood glamour image. So I'm not necessarily advocating that you give up Lightroom or Photoshop for in-camera JPEGs only. I, I feel that very often, though, especially with the Fuji X Pro 2, the film simulations end up being a much better place to start than the Adobe RAW rendering. Here's an Acros with green filter straight out of the camera. One of my shots from our Hollywood Glamour workshop. Pretty great the way it is, but it can still use some retouching. So straightening the tie, spotting, reworking the background highlight, and adding a split tone effect finishes it. So I just check out the, this has a little bit of a split tone. Here's the, the neutral raw in straight out of camera. And again, with the retouching. So do I need to say it? Okay, for review, mirrorless is the way to go for several reasons. The EVF offers the very real ability to see exactly what you're getting before you press the shutter. This means you are seeing the shot, not just pre-visualizing through a viewfinder. JPEGs are not bad. In fact, they can be your ally in creative image creation. Fuji's film simulations rock, and the shoot modes of dynamic range and highlight and shadow tone offer a lot of control over the look of the image, which you can use at the time of the shot or afterwards by reprocessing in the camera. Okay, so I'd like to thank Fuji for creating such great photo creation tools. Uh, there's a lot more to their system than just the film simulation modes. We didn't talk about the X-Trans sensor's lack of low-pass filter or the incredibly high quality optics or any of the other great camera models. So be sure to check those out. If you're already using another mirrorless system, try using picture styles for in-camera JPEGs or simply for changing the way you see the scene. You may find that it enhances your ability to see creatively. Be sure and check out my blog, my YouTube channel, and connect with me on social media. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Say it with me. JPEG is my friend. Thanks, everybody.